moderator for this session. I am your moderator in session, so uh, in, I'm your moderator for this session, and uh, I believe we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to, in this workshop portion of uh, the, the Conference on Global Higher Education, again, welcome. My name is Anthonette Gibson. Please feel free to call me Tony if that, that would be a little bit easier. Uh, and uh, our session will run from now 2.12 to 3.20, and we will hear from uh, our presenter, Maria uh, Wajardo. Uh, from Soka University and her research assistant, uh, Vohara. Uh, and um, I believe that I should certainly yield the floor to Maria and Swati, who will uh, move forward in this section of the uh, conference. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And welcome to all the participants this afternoon. I hope the morning's gone well. And for those of you that presented this morning, congratulations, uh, you got through it, so that's great. So the title of this workshop, Fostering a Global Mindset for an Uncertain Future. Part of what I was wanting to consider was during this time of globalization, during this time of a pandemic, how do we connect with one another? How do we continue to advance down this path? So I want to introduce myself first. My name is Maria Guajardo, as Tony shared. I am a professor at Soka University here in uh, Hachioji. And when I think about my classroom experience, uh, my goal is to create a learning space for my students so that they can, in fact, connect, connect head and heart. That is how I appro approach the teaching and learning space. Towards this end, I am absolutely convinced that to connect head and heart, learning has to be interactive. And so, hence, a workshop. And in this workshop, I'm going to forewarn you, you will be interacting. You will be asked to uh, engage with the chat, with uh, breakout sessions. And so I just want to give you advance warning. This is not a session where I'm going to give you a PowerPoint to download and say, thank you very much. And yeah, turn your camera off. No, this is going to be a session where I'm going to say, come, come and engage with me, come and engage with one another. So let's look at what the seminar goals are. In this process of engaged learning, my goal is to create an opportunity for us to go through these steps of becoming, knowing, and belonging. Because to explore global learning, to, to be able to approach this uncertain future, we need to have at the ready some tools. And one of those is praxis. How do we connect the knowledge that we are absorbing, hearing, listening to? How do we apply that to our lives and how do we create moments and opportunities for reflection? So in creating this learning space, it is my intention that we work together to develop, to enhance, to challenge a global mindset. So if we think about what does it mean to be a global learner, I'm going to ask you to jump into the chat and what words capture global learning for you? So what words capture global learning this is just a brainstorm first reaction don't be shy don't be shy whatever word comes to mind you think of a global learner who is that person someone who's intercultural thank you so much anna sophia someone who's curious absolutely so this idea of curiosity of questioning the world of engaging with the world mayumi absolutely it means someone who has a variety of perspectives someone who is flexible, who's accepting of others, Nemo, absolutely. There's that sense of openness. So that's what we think of when we're thinking of a, of a global learner. So in order to look at what are the elements of global learning, I would posit and suggest to you that it means having experiences. These experiences, as we see in the slide, are both individual and interactive. It means having this mindset that Paulo Freire calls, he's a Brazilian educator, this mindset of critical consciousness. To be able to question, to inquire, to see the relevance of learning to oneself. And then to also step into a space of expansion, which is cultural intelligence. 
Now, researchers and scholars posit that cultural intelligence is both the idea that you're integrating what you're learning and making it your own, but you're also differentiating. You're, you're seeing what is different, what is unique, how do you connect all the dots, all the pieces to the whole. So this is work that, um, in terms of global learning, the American Association of Colleges and Universities has advanced this idea. It's listed in, our re in the references at the end. You'll see their website. They have a whole section on resources and what it means to be a global learner. It also is based on the work of Dan Jenkins, who looks at global competencies, cultural competencies for learning. It's the work of Oslin and Mendehal, who have looked at global leadership. And there is much connection between global leadership and global learning. So we are going to jump into the first interactive exercise, because this is the process of becoming. This is the first step in the process of becoming. But let me, let me just stop. I know you're already looking at the questions. Let me just stop and, and ask you to think about how we're going to engage. So yes, this will be a diet exercise and you will be paired in with a partner randomly. But we have some rules about how we're going to do this exchange. So in this process of dialogue, one of you will be the speaker and one of you will be the listener. If you're the listener, keep your, keep your mute, keep, keep yourself muted. It's the easiest way to be a listener, right? You can gesture, you can laugh, you can smile, but your partner is not going to hear you. This is important. For this exercise, each one of you will have three minutes three minutes to begin to look at how do you share with someone? How do you capture who you are and what defines you? And, and you, can, you can absolutely select whatever comes to mind. So for some, it might be positionality. It might be place-based. It might be your family, cultural background, values. So be inclusive, whatever speaks to you in terms of how you want to share who you are and what defines you. So one speaker will have three minutes, your partner will listen, right? Um, whoever has the shortest hair will go first, all right? So there's no confusion here, no delay, no you go, no I go, no, 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 no. Whoever has the shortest hair goes first. One of you will have to have your phone or your watch handy so that you're scheduling, you know, you're, you're checking on the time, three minutes. When the three minutes are done, if you have your phone, you might just hold it up and just show your partner three minutes. Your partner mutes themselves. There is no discussion. There is no question asking. There is no conversation. The three minutes begin for your partner to go next. All right. And then your partner will have three minutes. So it will be a total of six minutes in this quick exercise. When the two of you are done, you come back to the main room and I'll be waiting for you. All right, you come back to the main room. Now, a couple of other things to think about. In this process of sharing, share what you feel comfortable sharing. All right, there is no obligation, there is no pressure. It is what, what you are moved to share at this moment. All right, and remember the topic is, who am I? What defines me? All right, so we are going to open up the breakout rooms. Um, you will be set, sent into a breakout room. You're going to have a partner. I know some of you just got a haircut, so your hair's a little shorter, but you know what? <laughs> Who's ever hair is shortest goes first, three minutes. Who are you? What defines you? Stop at three minutes, no dialogue, no conversation, just switch. And then if you were listening, it is your turn to speak. What happens if you run out of things to say. It happens. If you run out of things to say, you do not have permission to unmute yourself and then begin a conversation. You guys are tricky. I know you were going to try that. Don't do it. If you still have some time left, then talk about, I don't know what to say. All right. But it is not a time to have conversation. This particular diet exercise works this way. All right, so we are ready. Any questions? Any questions? All right, so off you go. Three minutes each. Who am I? What defines me? Maria, the instructions are also in the chat available. 
Thank you, Swati. So you will, for the three exercises that we'll be doing, you'll have access to the instructions there. Thank you so much, Swati. Yes, so Beth was waiting for, uh, yeah, doesn't have a partner right now. So, ah, so, okay, so, so Beth, do you want to pair up with me? Ah, there's a, no problem. Okay, hold on just a second. That would be great. I'm sorry, I signed it late. Swati, can we have them pair up? Yes, I'm just doing that. Okay, perfect. So both of you will be partners. Oh, it's not you, Maria and me. So Swati and me? Where did the other person? Okay. Hold on just a second. Yes, just a second. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so assign to six. Okay. okay. Can we stop recording? Thank you, Swati. All right, so it looks like the teams are back. Welcome back, welcome back. So let's take a few <laughs> minutes to talk about this. So what happened? You each had a few minutes to talk about who am I and what defines you? I'm going to pick on Anna and Barry since you were the first to return. Um, very prompt. You don't have to share content. What I'd like to reflect on is how was this process of sharing on these two questions? Anna? I think for us it was quite interesting. Um, we didn't, like you said, we didn't really have a conversation. We just listened to each other. But it turns out we are in very parallel us, I think, and we have very similar experiences. And it was good to be able to listen to someone who shares similar feelings about who they are and what defines them without interrupting constantly to ask questions or to say, oh, me too. And then the conversation goes somewhere else to just be able to listen to someone else's story. I think for me, that was a very interesting experience. Mm, thank you so much. I very <laughs> want to add anything. <laughs> Anna, you, you raised a couple of very important points. Each one of us has our own lived narrative. Each one of us has that unique story that we bring into the classroom, that we bring into our research, that we bring into a whole range of relationships. And you raised another very important point, not only our unique narrative, but what happens when we do not interrupt? When the speaker is not interrupted, they in fact tell their story, not the story that you want to hear, right? Anna, if you had stopped Barry and interrupted him and said, oh, well, tell me more about this. Yeah. Barry now would not be just sharing the narrative that had come to mind for him, but now he's following you down a track, down yeah. a pathway, right? So the absence of interruption creates a different dynamic in the sharing. Barry, what was the process like for you? Yeah, it was a good thing that uh, uh, I was unmuted because, uh, or rather, I, I think giving one, one uh, so, sorry, I'll just back up. Okay, it was great, but because I, I tend to go off in diversions as everybody who knows me, uh, it will attest to. And so it, it made me focus just on the essence, the three minute limit and only uh, talking once and then not breaking in on somebody else. So that kept the narrative really clean and tight. Um, and another thing was with regard to content was that both of us had, as Anna had mentioned, were sort of following parallel tracks in our quest to find ourselves. Um, both of us had come 
had probably been slightly dissatisfied in the places they were coming from, were seeking to find a better place, and therefore we uh, ended up uh, going on a journey, and which is in both our cases is only half finished, and we are constantly reinventing ourselves as we move towards the final stages. In my, in, in my case, the final stages of life. In Anna's case, the early stages of her life. So imagine Anna and Barry had a total of six minutes. And listen to what they were able to grasp and embrace in terms of this very short sharing. So let me ask, uh, let me pick another pair. Hazel, who was your partner? Uh, my partner is Beth. Okay, so Hazel, from your perspective, now I'm going to flip it a little bit. How was it just to listen? Actually, it was kind of interesting. Although sometimes you tend to like, I, I tend to like control myself from reacting like giving words, but with my... I, I could see that with my expressions and everything, the other person who was talking, like in this case, Beth, she was more like excited to share and to say something and, and vice versa. Like when I'm talking and I see expressions of interest, expressions of like, um, like joy and like excitement, like, yeah, yeah, it's, especially in our case, wow we came from the same country we were doing the like we we taught in the same university i mean oh, oh my and we're teaching the same the same subjects here all the different universities come on <laughs> and you didn't like, know each it. other no 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 this is excellent <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to talk as, as you said, we have very, actually we had like four or five minutes because she came later right right nah. yeah i could see in expressions help a lot in oh sharing more yes hazel you raise a very important point and that is that we have to debunk this idea that listening is passive mm -hmm. listening is not passive listening in fact is a different pathway for expression right what you said was your body language was communicating or her body language was communicating volumes so as we think about how are we going to step into this world of global learning, we're in it already. Just by virtue of being at this conference, doing the work that we do, we are already in that hemisphere, if you will, right? But as we do it, I think to be able to set our intention and understanding of what will this work, this experience require of us. And I would suggest to all of you, whether you're official role is that of scholar, student, lifelong learner, uh, family member. We are always in moments where we are going to be able to dialogue. And dialogue does not mean that you have to be talking in order to learn and to communicate. So Beth, now that we know that the two of you quite randomly were paired, let me ask you the question, how was it for you to listen to Hazel's narrative? Oh, I'm always a good listener. <laughs> and because uh, listening, actually, you get so much thing uh, to know one person and to also know how to deal with the problems that is uh, you're facing. So sometimes, uh, if the person is not talking, one thing is uh, you need to give some initiative or try to tell the person that uh, you're willing to listen anytime. And uh, lending an ear is actually very difficult because you get to know the personality, you, you get to know what is the problem and you can relay also on how to uh, to tell the your counterpart that it is okay to speak, even uh, especially here in Japan that uh, English is uh, really a big uh, wall to most of the students. That you have to tell them that it's okay for not being perfect. So you are willing to listen to them. You are willing to understand because. The language is not uh, in the perfections, but uh, in how you will really relay it 
Mm. And it's the, it's the same thing as in your teaching, you know, you, you are not expected to teach a very perfect uh, um, classroom, but instead you, how you tell your students mm. that you are willing to listen to them. Correct. No Correct. matter how how uh, how bad the English is, you know. Thank you, Beth. So when we again, when we engage in dialogue, this this perspective of listening to understand versus listening to ask the question. Oftentimes we are engaged listeners, but really what we're doing is that we're mentally exercising. Should I ask this question or this question? I wonder why she didn't or he didn't say this. Let me ask that question. Right, so I'm asking you to develop a new skill set here. Listening to understand. Let me take one more dyad and then we're going to take the next activity, which is totally different. Okay, is it Mabu Mabube? Yes. Yes. Who was your partner? Uh, Mimo, I think. Excellent. All right. How was it for you to respond to these questions, which could be very personal? Right, it, it's revealing who you are. So, how was this experience for you? Um, so, I think for us, we had kind of different experiences, or how we approached the questions. It was a little bit different about the points that we talked about. But as you said, I was paying attention to understanding. Um, I usually ask questions, and I like talking, <laughs> so it was a good practice for me to try to focus on only listening and understanding. Um, yeah, so I think that was interesting for me. Great, great. And Nemo, how was it for you listening to Mabube? Yeah, actually, like I was the first speaker, so like listening to her, like. Well, I was kind of thinking like, why didn't I share the same information? <laughs> why did I talk about like my values and oh my God, I shouldn't say like my name and like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> but like, I kind of realized that this is how different we are, you know? So that's not a bad thing. And that's exactly right. So part of what both of you are sharing is that how we show up and what we share in fact, is shaped by what we may have just heard, right? So we're not in silos. We're, we're being influenced by the person in front of us. And I would suggest to you in learning spaces, whether you're in the teaching position or in the student learning position, you are being shaped by those around you constantly. So the question is, how, to, how do we make this a learning experience, a deeper learning experience, so that we can, in fact, begin to travel and navigate through this complex world of, of developing this global mindset. All right, are you ready for the next exercise? So now, let me just capture some of the work you did by Paulo Freire's quote. And he said, true knowledge emerges through restless, impatient, hopeful, critical inquiry with other people about their relations to the world. So think a moment about how much did you learn by listening to a partner? And for some of you, you were meeting a stranger for the first time. How much did you learn about this other person in three minutes? Right? When you stop and think about the limited amount of time against the amount of learning that happened, my guess is that it was more than you might have anticipated. So we're going to go a little deeper now into the process of knowing. We're going to be dividing you up into smaller groups, but larger than the two. Now it will be a group of four, depending on how many participants we have. It may be three or four. And there are three questions that I'd like you to answer. You will only have two minutes to share. And the questions will go into the chat, so you'll have access to them. So these are the three questions. Please share your full name and how you like it to be pronounced and where you spent your childhood. Share your mother's full name and where she spent her childhood. And then share your mother's mother's name, maternal grandmother, and where she spent her childhood. This is going to go very fast. If there are four people in a group, it'll be two minutes each. 
right? So watch the time. Don't take up too much verbal space. That's how I politely say don't talk too much, right? I want you to share, but we also want to see, can we sh all share during this, this limited time that we have today? All right, two minutes each. Let's see, this time, um, yeah, we're gonna go by hair length because that's an easy one, all right? So this time we'll go opposite, longer hair sh to shortest hair, right? If you have the longest hair in your group, you will be the first speaker. You will have two minutes to answer those questions. And then it's just round robin. Whoever was first, and then the next person, and then the next person. When your group is done sharing, take a breath and come back to the main room. All right. So, Swati, how are we going to do this in terms of dividing up? Oh, there they go. All right. and we can stop recording. Um, how do we get to know one another? How do we get to learn about our place, our connections, our legacy? So I would love to go with uh, the second group that came in, and was that Victor, Barry, Kazayuki, and Nimo? I think that was the group. That was the group. Um, Oh, okay. We just lost Kazuyuki because he went to his part-time job. All right. The three of you will carry on though. So, Victor, we haven't heard from you. How was this exercise of reflecting on your your family, your your mother, your mother's mother, yourself, your place of childhood? How was it, Victor? Um, for me, it was, um, it was a good experience because um, it gave me the opportunity to really reflect on myself. And I was able to be true to myself, you know, I, because when it comes to talking about my mother, I was talking from my heart and I was, it was my pride to share with, you know, um, to share with other people that I'm a proud, uh, I'm a, you know, a proud son and I'm um, doing my best at uh, where I am right now. Yes. Thank you, Victor. And let me ask you, Victor, how much did you learn? about your group partners? Because they only shared two minutes. When you reflect on this, how much did you learn about each one of them? How? Um, did you learn something new? Yes, I did. I did learn something new. Um, like um, where they came from and uh, you know, mm, their mother's names. Yes. Those are the things. Mm. The authenticity. Yes, that's what I learned from them. All right. Thank you so much, Victor. So I'm looking at Beryl. Were you in a group with Tony, Kay Ying, and Igeta? Yeah, Tony and, oops. Yeah, Tony and Kazu. Uh, uh, okay, okay. So Beryl, how was this exercise of reflecting on your background, your beginnings? Well, as you know, Tony and I are our best buddies anyway. But what was interesting is like um, me telling her about telling her my mother's name and my grandmother's name, that was interesting to her. And also likewise, because we know so much about each other anyway, um, but going digging back into the past, we both know we're from Washington, uh, which is interesting. Um, but, you know, we, our parents migrated to Washington in, in different ways. So I, I just, it gave me a little different perspective of mm -hmm. Tony, which is always um, enlightening for me. <clears throat> and for me talking about my uh, background, I do that a lot anyway, in the kind of work that I do. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, so in some of the projects that I've been working on recently, I've been going back and writing about it. So this has been really easy for me Mm -hmm. But um, what was interesting was for me to think about my uh, maternal grandmother, Christine, because, and I realized how much I didn't have very much time with her because she died at an early age. And I hadn't even processed and thought about that in many, many decades, you know, and how I wish I had had more time to spend with her. Mm -hmm. That was a new revelation for me about my family. Yeah, so this exercise gives us an opportunity to position ourselves within our family, mm -hmm. within our past, right? 
But what's the purpose of doing this positioning, Keying? What would you say? What what came out of this? Why do you think I would include this in this workshop on global learning? Um, I think um, from this exercise, we know about the history. Because in order to know the history, we can only acknowledge the culture and the cultural differences between each person. And as a global citizen or um, we want to work for global issues and problems, we need to really know about the underlying causes of the problems, such as the cultural backgrounds or um, what are the issues that cause these problems to emerge. And yeah, that's what I think, like the history and culture. Mm. And that history and culture, Kei Ying, as you shared, shapes who we are, right? Your mindset, your global perspective, how you view the world is shaped by this. And the better connected we are to that shaping influence, the more informed, and I would suggest to you, the more impactful we will be in deciding where we stand, how we stand, for what purpose and what perspective. So if we'll go back to the PowerPoint, so some of the learnings that come from this then, from these two exercises is that we learn to listen to understand. We also learn that listening does not, it requires not interrupting sometimes. It means not preparing to question, but really having your intention set around understanding. It also means building trust, right? Many of you were strangers to each other until 45 minutes ago. And now you're, t you're talking to me about parallel career paths. I mean, how does that happen, right, in, in this format? Well, part of it is that there was a level of trust that emerges when we share our narrative. So that even though we can be seen very, or we feel very different from those around us, as this picture reflects, right here I am with a group of high school students uh, in Kansai, very different from my own beginnings, very different from language, worldview, and yet, because we allow ourselves to connect with one another, we begin, we begin to advance in this understanding of what global learning might be. And so onto the next slide, what we also recognize is that dialogue is not conversation. Dialogue, Paulo Freire would suggest, is not a game of ping pong. Oh, I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk. That's ping pong. That's a conversation that is not dialogue. In fact, dialogue is a process of transformation that authenticness that Victor was describing, you know, how you show up in your most authentic self in this process of exchanging a certain level of transformation. Some would suggest that's the only kind of true dialogue. And so we have a, a few minutes. I am going to, to push us through the third exercise because we've looked at the process of becoming. We've looked at the process of knowing. And I want us just briefly to connect to the process of belonging. Where do we belong? When do we know that we belong? So quickly, if you could go to the chat, all I want is an age. At what age, what is your one early memory of when you recognized that you were different, that you did not belong? And that sense of not belonging could have been based on language or age religion, race or ethnicity, uh, gender perspective, gender identity, physical ability. Let's go to the chat. At what age, what's your earliest memory of feeling different? Okay, so we started with the age of 12 and now it's going down to six. Anna, Nemo. Mabube at six, preschooler around five. Mayumi at the age of four. So look at this, look at, look at these ages, look at how relatively young these experiences of recognizing that we are different, that we are not the same, based on some characteristic or based on some physical 
attribute, right? Now, if you stop to think about it, what were the feelings associated with that sense of difference? And this is, you're going to have a partner to share that with, but I wanted to just first set your mind to when was that age? What category might you say did it connect to? You know, for me, at the age of five, I knew that I didn't speak English. Spanish is my first language. And I went into a classroom where everyone was an English speaker. And back then, I mean, this is how old I am. We didn't have bilingual education. It was sink or swim immersion. I don't remember anything at the age of five because my whole world was Spanish at home, English at school, right? That was my one of my earliest memories. So now what I want you to do, we're going to put you in last time with a partner. You're going to go into your breakout rooms. It's going to be the same system. Now you know, you know what it is. You're becoming experts at it. You're each going to have three minutes. It's going to be very short, maybe two minutes. It's going to be that short to be able to just share what was that age? What was the difference? Most importantly, what was the feeling? What was the feeling? Shortest hair goes first. You have two minutes to share, two minutes to listen, then switch. When you're done with your four minutes, come back. I'll be waiting for you. Bye. Off you go. Two minutes. Okay. Cheryl and Maria, can we have you both together? Beryl, can we share since it's an odd number? Hello? Hi. <laughs> can we, yeah, we're I, not I, gonna put you in a, we're not gonna put you in a breakout room because there's an odd number. One of the other participants had to leave. That's okay. I just came in. Um, so I just wanted to say hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I had, a, I had a voice lesson. Um, so uh, to give a student. So um, oh, I'm okay. here. I just want to say hi. And um, I'm sorry, I missed it. But I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Our discussion. All right. So who would like to share? If you volunteer, then you're volunteering your partner as well. And that's good. That shows some leadership here. So who would like to share? How was this experience? Hazel, who was your partner? And please. My what partner is Tony. I can volunteer because she, she can talk, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Yes. So anyway, during our talk, it was really interesting. It was very fast, but still we learned a lot of things. And we still got a chance to know a little bit deeper on what uh, on our answers. For example, in my case, I felt negative, uh, well, negative vibes around what, five years old since uh, due to religion differences. Uh, well, I, I was born in the Philippines, you know, it's a Christian country, but majority are Catholics and I'm not, a, I'm not a Catholic. So every time they pray, I was telling her they do the sign of the cross and I don't know this, their festivals. I don't know anything about this. So this kind of negativity kind of uh came on me and was like i'm so different they discriminate me on this they don't i don't know these things mm. at that early age but uh as i told tony we uh, we learned I, I learned to be more forgiving accepting as i grew up and i said oh so this is we, i learned to be more open something like that even in our discussion yeah, thank, so open. <laughs> thank you, Hazel, because you raise a really important point, and that's that these early experiences of being the other, there could be negative reactions, there could be positive reactions, but what you also shared was that it became a crucible moment, that you recognized that you could grow from this, right? And it's who you are today. So, Tony, would you share a little bit? How was the experience of reflecting on this question? Well, I, I certainly enjoyed the experience of talking with, with Hazel and just seeing uh, parallels that we both uh, experienced the feeling of difference in a religious setting. 
And uh, um, I think Hazel certainly touches on how we both sort of, um, you know, went through sort of a, a kind of human revolution in, in our growth, but we were also you know, but prior to that, Hazel, and you, if you agree with me, uh, we were questioning. You know, we we went we we were questioning and wanting to understand more. And based on our efforts to understand more, uh, we could in fact find a place of acceptance and tolerance, and understanding, and we could grow more. Mm. So I, I appreciated that very much. Um, Thank you. Really, kind of you know taking those baby steps to figure out a way to open and warm our hearts. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Tony. Mayumi, who were you paired with? Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. And Mayumi, how was this experience for you? Because I remember in the chat, you were at a very young age when you said you remember feeling othered. Yes. Uh, yes, my, that, at that time I moved to, moved from countryside in Japan to capital. So the, I realized others speak, others speaking uh, different dialect, a standard dialect, uh, while my dialect is more countryside one. Then mm. yes, that's my first experience of being different. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Mayumi. And so this idea that, right, our entity, our, our self can recognize these differences at a very young age and that these experiences are shaping. So if we go to the last two slides and then we'll open it up, our worldview, our worldview must broaden to embrace others. And in order to do this, I would suggest to you that our job is not to try to simplify the world. So often we're misdirected. We think, well, just make it simpler for me or give me a checklist. Tell me what people from Indonesia are like and then I'll know. Or tell me what every African-American woman's like, then I'll know, right? We're not that simple. We're not that simple. And so our challenge as global learners is in fact to enhance to heighten our level of comfort with the complex, with the concepts that there's not easy answers or easy descriptors for who we are. And then moving on to the next slide, it's important to ask who sees you and what does it mean to be seen by others? As social beings, we want to be seen by others. We need that human contact. I remember coming to Japan, I don't speak Japanese, and I felt like I was in a bubble of isolation, right? Where at the store, I couldn't ask for what I was looking for. On campus, everything was in Japanese and I wasn't sure who might be able to help me. There was this sense of disconnect. So it's important to be able to acknowledge whether we're in whatever role we are in, are we seen by others? And what does that mean for us in order to be able to participate fully in our diverse roles? And so then to conclude, if we're trying to examine the global learning process, which is, I, which is what I was hoping to walk you through today, it's looking at becoming, knowing, and belonging. Who are you? Who is the other? Who do you see and who sees you? I would suggest to you that in this process of, be, of broadening our global mindset, we want to be seen. And we also have to do the hard work of seeing others. So I wanna just open it up now for dialogue and discussion. We've got a few minutes. If you have questions, I'd like to hear your questions. I may not have answers, but I want to hear your questions. All right, can I can I go first then? Please, Anna. So I was wondering how you incorporate this kind of activities in your classrooms to kind of broaden your students' horizon. That's a great question, Anna. So I'll share one example. I am teaching a psychology of leadership course. I have 45 students. 
they come from 14 countries and they speak uh, just over 17 languages, depending on whether I count dialects. All right. So it's like a mini United Nations class. Mm. And I begin my class with a connector question. I don't call them icebreakers anymore. I'm teaching on Zoom. So everyone goes to the chat and has to answer a question. Sometimes the question could be, what is your superpower? Um, the question may be related to the content. It's designed to open the door to questioning, to being curious, to being vulnerable. I love questions like, what are you more afraid of? Wild animals or the dark, right? And it's like students, like they share, they tell you. And then that begins to take us in. This process of dialogue, my, I incorporate it in every class. I will provide the students with a question that doesn't have an easy answer. Here, the questions were really designed to focus on connecting with self and with other. In the course, it might be a question about global issues. It might be a question about um, sense of agency. Like, when have you felt most powerful? Where does your power come from, right? I mean, it's these broader questions that is asking students to, to push through. My job is not to repeat what they would have read in the textbook. I, I start with the assumption we have all read the same material. Let's challenge what it is that we've read. Let's, it's that praxis. How do we apply this? And so my students, if you were to ask them, they show up in class terrified because they're going to be called on. They're going to be, they're going to have to offer, engage. And so my goal is to make that engagement occur in a safe place. So the exercises that you have done today have all been done by my students. Not all at once and not at warp speed like we did today. Uh, it might be one exercise. But every class starts with a connector. I will end every class usually with a question on a scale of one to 10. How are you feeling right now? And they will they will respond to that or I'll say, what's the temperature? Imagine that that you're you're going to you're a thermometer and you're going to or you're a forecasting weather forecasting system. What is the temperature today? Are you cloudy? Are you sunny? Are you stormy? And they come up with, you know, no, I, I'm, do, I'm going through typhoon season right now. It's like, OK, that tells me a lot because I believe that learning happens when we connect head and heart. Learning on content alone, I think, is minimal learning. But learning that connects head and heart is transformative. Thank you. That's so relevant, especially now that we're all online. It's so hard for me to sometimes get my students to connect with each other. And, you know, I use my classes to give them their English classes, but to give them an opportunity to express themselves and their beliefs and their experiences in English. But just being online can sometimes create another barrier yeah. um, to this vulnerability. Um, so that's those are very interesting options that I hadn't considered. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Anna. Other reflections, other experiences? Maria, there's a question in chat by Beryl. Hey, Maria. Mm. Yes, I just wanted to know if you could elaborate more was it cultural intelligence? That's what um, you introduced in the beginning. I'm really curious a little bit. Could you like go into a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So probably what might be more familiar is emotional intelligence. Daniel Goldman's concept of emotional intelligence that in order to be effective leaders, we need to have competencies in five areas. We need to be able to know ourselves. So that sense of self-awareness, we need to be able to manage our own emotions. We need to be able to read the air, as we say in Japanese, right? I always forget the phrase. I always ask my students, how do you say this in Japanese? But there's this concept that you read the air, right? It's, it's floating around. You have to be observant. So the idea that you can read the air is one of those elements that you can read the emotional state of those that are around you. And then most importantly, and I think people often forget that this is really at the crux of emotional intelligence, the idea that you can manage that emotional state that 
is present in your followers and yourself in order to reach um, a shared goal. Now I share all of that barrel to say cultural intelligence emerged from this line of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so cultural intelligence then is suggesting that there are competencies on being able to be self-aware about your own cultural identity, mm -hmm. mindset and perspective. So going through those stages of not only reading yourself, but reading others. And then, but the end point here is being able to manage those differences towards a shared goal. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the understanding of this cultural global mindset that individuals, because no one is a blank slate. No matter how much we test students and say, well, everyone's at the N1 level or everyone's at the 50% level, or, I mean, we're, we're dividing our students up based on proficiency all the time. And that's just one level of assessment, mm -hmm. right? So how we begin to build bridges. So cultural intelligence is this idea of bridge building based on a competency and ability to, to connect first with yourself in terms of your own cultural mindset and then that of others. So thank you thank for that. Thank you. Question. Anyway, I've enjoyed this session so much. I just wanted to say that verbally to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. Well, we yes. have like one minute left. So you know what? I'm going to go to the chat and I'm going to ask you, how are you doing right now? Right? One word, two words. How are you feeling right now? Go to the chat and let's close the circle because that's important. Thank you, Beth. Great. Anna, inspired, Victor, motivated. I love it, Tony. Yeah, weather forecast, it is bright and sunny. <laughs> Encouraged. Mm. Okay, go to the chat. If, if I can say a few seconds. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, about your emotional, uh, you know, you, you need to know your students, look at their faces, and then you will connect. <laughs> That is one thing I, I learned from so many years in the academy. You, you need just to see their faces. And you know, what I love about teaching on Zoom is that everyone is in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I interpret Zoom. Everyone is in the front row of my class. And it's great. I'll ask a question and they have the same behavior that they would in class. They don't want to be called on and they look down. <laughs> All of a sudden, I see everybody, the top of everyone. It's like, come on. All right. Or they'll turn their camera off, right? And it's like, I Bye. can still see your presence. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, I just want to thank you all very much. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Maria. This was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Swati, uh, uh, Vahora, I'm so sorry, Vahora, for really navigating us through the, 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 the important uh, opportunities to engage. Uh, you did a marvelous job uh, technically and, and smoothly allowing us to, to reconnect and connect again and connect again and to the point where we're all inspired and and uh, feeling, uh, you know, um, inspired, encouraged, and, and uh, insightful. So uh, this will conclude our uh, our two ten to three twenty session workshop session, uh, fostering a global mindset for an uncertain future, uh, um, um, by uh, Dr. Wahado Maria Wahado, and uh, again her assistant. And so, uh, needless to say, there will be um, again. Uh, uh, these mat materials, the recording of this session will be available, uh, as well as additional materials. Really kind of situation. Uh, and so I tend to start with trying to let's, let's leave. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm so sure thank you both. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, have a great evening and be safe. And uh, 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 we'll look forward to seeing you hopefully at the end of the, the, the session, of the end of the conference. Thank, thank you. you so much, Tony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you.